Hello, Malcolm here, and welcome to another class for the Thames Valley Churches of Christ. And this is a new series. It's called A New Creation. And that's taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. And it follows on really rather nicely from our series called A New Thing. Because if God is going to do a new thing, he needs a new creation. He needs a renewed people. And that's what we are. And we are this because Jesus came. And because of his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, the Holy Spirit has been poured out on you and me, and a beachhead of the kingdom has been established. This new creation that's coming, the fullness of it, has been revealed at least in part here on this earth through his people, God's people. And as such, as we live out what it means to be a new creation, we hopefully encourage people to join us and come with us, kind of enticing them into saying, come on, look, there's some hope for a different way to live that's not like this messed up world around us. So come and meet Jesus who's recreated us so that you can have this new hope. And that's kind of what it's all about, really. So that's personal and, and collective as we meet together with groups of fellow believers. So what does it, though, mean exactly to live like a new creation? And that's what we're going to explore in these classes. And I'm not going to surprise you by saying that the main way we're going to do this is by looking at the life of Jesus himself. He is our inspiration he is our example. And as we learn from him and find the ways that we can live in Christ-likeness and we encourage and help each other to do that together and we tap into the power of the Spirit to do so, again, we will show the world what the new creation is really all about. So let's look at one example of Jesus today, one incident in his life, and see what we can learn. And we're going to be in Matthew chapter 20, so you might like to turn there in your Bibles. And we're going to focus in particular towards the end of the chapter on the healing of the two blind men. But we will talk a bit about the rest of chapter 20 to put it in context. And what I'd like to ask you to do as we uh, go through this is to, look at, is to notice a few things. Firstly, look at the theme of compassion and generosity. That applies to Jesus, to God. Compassion and generosity. Notice also the theme of anger, grumbling and anger and selfish ambition. And then also notice in particular, and that's where we'll conclude, is with Jesus and the two blind men, how willing Jesus is to interrupt his schedule for the sake of noticing that God is doing something and that he can help somebody. So those are some things to bear in mind as we, as we look through uh, the rest of this chapter here. So first of all, just going briefly from the beginning, first of all, the parable, the parable of the landowner who hires some laborers to work in his, uh, in, his, uh, in his vineyard. And he, without going through the whole parable, you may know it, he pays the people that begin the day the same as he pays the people that come along later in the day and that he hires. And He's doing uh, all this, and towards the end of the day, he then pays everybody the same. And the people who came early in the day and had worked all day, they, it says, grumbled in verse 11. They grumbled against the landowner. The last worked only one hour. You've made them equal to us. That's an interesting phrase, equal to us, who borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. He said, friend, I am only doing you no wrong. I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last, which is a theme that comes up a lot in the Gospels and comes up again later in this chapter. So this is a parable about the generosity of God. And really it's a parable told against the Pharisees and people like that who think they deserve uh, privileges. And they are angry at the way that Jesus is treating the people who don't look like they really deserve to be in the kingdom of God or at, uh, at Johnny Come Lately's and don't deserve the same kind of rewards. Don't they deserve more honor because they've been at this, you know, from the beginning. Jesus says, look, if God is generous, why would you want to argue against that if you understand the heart of God, and clearly they don't. And when we talk about the blind men later, we're seeing here that there are some people who are blind in a different way. They're blind to the heart of God. And that's what's being revealed here. And to live as a new creation means to know the heart of God and reveal the heart of God accurately by the way that we live. Anyway, next thing that happens is he takes the disciples aside and he tells them, I'm going to Jerusalem. The Son of Man, that's himself, is going to be handed over, condemned, to, given to the Gentiles, he's going to be mocked, flogged, crucified, 
and on the third day raised. Now, there's no direct comment from that, but he's warning them this is on the horizon. Indeed, we are on the road to Jerusalem here. We're coming up to the triumphal entry and then the uh, the events that lead to the crucifixion. So he's talking to his disciples about the cost here. Do they understand the cost? Are, there, are their eyes open to the cost? Living as a new creation has its costs. Then, in interestingly, the mother of the sons of Zebedee comes up, that's James and John, kneels in front of Jesus in verse 20, and, and he says, what do you want? And interesting, Jesus asks the question. She says, declare that these two sons of mine will sit, one at your right hand and one at your left. Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup? They say, yeah, we can do that, though they can't really. And he says, but look, it's, <laughs> you will drink the cup, but to sit at my right and my left, that's, uh, that's not mine to grant. Uh, that's been prepared by my father. So we've got some selfish ambition going on here. We don't know why exactly the mother of Zebedee asks us for this uh, benefit for her, her sons. Maybe it's just motherly pride. Interestingly, this is a side point, but something to think about. It's one of the very few times that a woman who's connected with Jesus makes a mistake. There's very few. You could say that perhaps Martha is like that. You could say that Jesus' mother, when she's trying to take care of him because he's, she thinks he's out of his mind. But the majority of the time, the women in the Gospels get it right, uh, whether they are noted followers of Jesus or people who just encounter him, whereas the men are the ones that ordinarily seem to get it wrong all the time. So it, it is notable here that this is being one of the few times it must be significant that she gets uh, a woman gets it wrong. Anyway, that's a whole other uh, story, uh, perhaps. The response of the other disciples in verse 24. When the ten hear about this, they were angry with the two brothers. It doesn't say they were angry with, the, <laughs> with their mother, but they're angry with the brothers. Jesus calls them together and says, you know the rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them. Their great ones are tyrants over them. It will not be so among you. Whoever wishes to be great must be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man himself came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He's just talked about that, about going to Jerusalem and being crucified. So again, we see anger here. Now, these are disciples of Jesus, but they're not much less blind than the Pharisees at this point. They still don't get the heart. You see this, the thread? They're not understanding the heart. If Jesus is going to have uh, uh, evidence of the new creation breaking into this world, hearts have to be changed. So there has to be new spiritual insight and sight for that to happen. So one of the key things about being a Christian is not so much that we behave the right way, but that we grasp the true heart of God. And that is what inspires us to live the right kind of way. That's what Jesus is really concerned about here. They don't understand. They don't understand the heart. He's demonstrating it by the way that he lives. And then we get to the blind men. So let's talk about uh, these chaps for a few moments and see what we learn. So they're leaving Jer Jericho because he's going to Jerusalem. There's a large crowd following him. Now, again, we have followers. So they are, at least on some level, disciples. Large crowd following him. He's leaving Jericho on his way to Jerusalem. The crowd are following. They think he's something, something amazing, even if they don't fully understand everything. They're following. And there are two blind men sitting by the roadside. If they're sitting there, it means they're begging. That's what's going on. They heard that Jesus was passing by, and they shouted so really loud, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Interesting phrase here, son of David, rarely used, uh, especially in Matthew, means that they understand that he is a messianic king. He's of the line of David. And so they recognize something more than most people do. So they, uh, they are showing insight and sight into the identity of Jesus that most people have missed, even though they are blind. Interesting irony there. I think there's something we're being told here spiritually. They have this insight that he's son of David. It says the crowd, the followers, right, are following him. The crowd sternly ordered them to be quiet. They do not see the hand of God at work here. Be quiet. They, but they, the men, shouted even more loudly. They demonstrate faith in a way, right, courageous faith. They shout more loudly, have mercy on us, Lord. Now, mercy. Remember we talked about compassion a bit earlier? We see a lack of mercy 
in other people, in the parable of the landowner and the people that grumble against him. We see a lack of mercy, perhaps with the 10 who are angry with the uh, James and John. But here we also see a lack of mercy in the crowd, not caring about these blind men. But the blind men have trust in the mercy of Jesus. You see, again, they understand something about his heart that everybody else in chapter 20 is missing. Have mercy on us, Lord, son of David. Jesus stood still. And this is a really interesting thing. I'm a small detail, but I think it's significant. He stood still. He stopped. Now, I don't know if you've ever, you've ever been sort of stopped in your tracks by something. Occasionally you see something, you hear something, it just stops you. Um, physically or metaphorically, you just, you're, you're caught up in the moment of, wow, what, what, what's happening? And it's something like that that's happening here with Jesus. Think about the scene. I mean, he's got a crowd. The crowd must be pretty noisy. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's got the cross to go to. I mean, he's got a He's got an agenda. He's got a schedule. He's, he's got to go there. He's got to get there in time for uh, the Passover. And yet, these two blind men, begging by the side of the road, stop him in his tracks. What's going on? He stood still. And he calls them. He wants them with him. And he says, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you. He's engaging them personally, directly. He's understanding God is at work. They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. Let our eyes be opened. They are not afraid to tell him exactly what they want, exactly what they need. They trust that he has something in his heart for them. He, he, he cares. And then it says, and this is just beautiful in verse 34, moved with compassion. Jesus touched their eyes. Immediately they regained their sight. And what did they do? Followed him. Now we have real followers. <laughs> now we have real followers who trust him, understand his power, believe that he cares, understand his heart, and they are following. The ten still haven't quite got it, maybe. The crowd certainly don't. The Pharisees absolutely do not. But these two men understand something about Jesus and his heart, and they follow. Jesus is moved with compassion. You know, Jesus didn't have to be moved with compassion. I mean, in a sense, he could say, right, okay, I'm going to heal you. Fine, no problem. I've got the power. But he touches their eyes and deals with it because he's moved with compassion. And I think, again, what I'm seeing here personally is, it seems to me, is we're seeing that Jesus recognizes that even though this is interrupting his plans and is not part of his schedule, his diary for the day, he's willing to stop He's willing to engage, ask a question, and use what he's got, some gifts he's got, to help these people with their obvious problem. He's interruptible. One of the most impressive things about Jesus, he's God in the flesh. He's, he's an important guy. And he's got a lot of important things to do, but he's interruptible by normal, needy people. Now, this is true, I think, spiritually, but also, in a sense, materially, physically. Jesus, the Son of God, pays attention. And this is something that perhaps we've got to wrestle with. I know I struggle with this because I don't like my schedule being interrupted by things. I like to know what's happening and when. I like to keep on my schedule that I've decided. And yet, if I'm going to imitate Jesus, if we're going to be the new creation and show people the heart of God, we've got to first learn how to notice when God is at work and secondly, allow that to interrupt our priorities. What does that mean for you? And this is where I'd like to leave you thinking about this and discussing it as a group. How do we notice when God is at work? What are some of the signs that reveal to us we need to pay attention to this right now? This situation, these people, people in our neighborhood, people in our church, people who have been coming to church with us or our meetings, friends that we're connected with, things that are going on with our family or at work. Or how do we... How do we notice that God is at work in a special way? Like there's something unusual going on here, like he does for these blind men in this situation. How do we notice? What are the noticing? What are the warning signs in a sense? And then secondly, how do we feel about being interrupted? And what helps us to overcome our resistance to being interrupted? People that are the new creation, who are imitating the life of Jesus, notice God at work, and, and allow themselves to be interrupted from their priorities so that God can work through them. 
What does it mean to be interrupted? How do we recognize God at work? And how do we overcome the resistance to being interrupted and having our priorities reorganized by God? So let me know the fruit of your discussions. And next time we'll go and look at another example of Jesus. But for now, we'll leave it at that. I hope you find this class helpful. Let me know what it means for you to be a new creation. Till the next time, take care and God bless. Thank you.